If you were a kid back in the early 80s, you would have experienced the golden age for video games. You remember the arcade games that made your piggy bank bleed? Or how about the Atari 2600? And hey, we can't forget the amazing classics such as E.T., the extraterrestrial. And unlike today where we're used to gigabytes of storage with all the huge AAA games that we can store and play just fine in our PC, the games back then hardly stored any data. The Atari 2600 can only store between 4 kilobytes and 8 kilobytes, while the arcade games had to use specialized, dedicated, and expensive hardware just to play one arcade game, so the games back then were barely a game. And while the NES came along sometime soon in 1985, Sorry, I don't have the real thing. And added just a little bit more data, the games were still barely a game, so the scope of the games were very limited. But that all changed with the release of an unknown game known as Super Mario Bros. Whenever you bring out your NES, slap the cartridge in, plug in your controller, and turn that sucker on, all of a sudden you're playing in this massive horizontal world with all these huge side-scrolling levels. See this, son? This right here was my childhood. Whoa. This is shit. Now, Nintendo has always had their own unique ways of compressing these huge, massive games with such little storage data. For example, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which takes forever to complete and to find everything that exists, still managed to fit into a whopping 13 gigabytes, which still offers way more content than what Team Fortress 2 and CSGO offers. Now, what about Super Mario Bros? When I downloaded a ROM of Super Mario Bros, my mind was blown away when I found out the game was only about 40 kilobytes. The file size of this PNG screenshot I took of the game is more than the game itself, and 40 kilobytes is only enough for a 2 second mp3 file of the Super Mario Bros overworld song. So I wondered to myself, how? How did Super Mario Bros manage to fit this huge horizontal world with such little storage data? So hello, my name is Joseph R. Carroll, and today we'll be discussing not only how Super Mario Bros was made for the NES, but also how Super Mario Bros was created with such little storage data. I'd like to take you all back to the early technology of cartridges. Remember those? The ones that were like the DS cartridges but were massive? CDs came along sometime soon and could store way more data, and comparing the two side by side, if you throw a cartridge at the wall, the wall would break. Meanwhile, if you lay a finger on a CD, but unlike CDs, the NES cartridges not only stored very little data, but if you look inside different NES games, the hardware itself was actually very different from each other. The Legend of Zelda, for example, was the first game with a save and load feature and was able to do that thanks to the battery that came with the cartridge. That battery would keep part of the memory data powered on at all times to not lose data. So let's take a look inside the Super Mario Bros. cartridge. Inside you may notice two chips. One is labeled as the CHR chip, which stands for character, handling about 8 kilobytes for the graphics, and another labeled as the PRG chip, which stands for programming, handling 32 kilobytes worth of code and data, though the NES only had 2 kilobytes of RAM. The graphics were rendered with a 256 by 240 screen, and it contained two layers, one as the background and the other as the independent sprites. If you do the math, the screen would have 61,440 pixels total. However, the NES couldn't handle rendering each and every individual pixel, so instead the game was made of tile sets. For a brief recap, tile sets are basically groups or collections of pixels, and each tile for the NES was 8 by 8 pixels. Now the screen would have to render 32 by 30 tile sets, which saves a lot of bytes, but even that wasn't powerful enough to render, so the game would render a couple of rows or columns one at a time. This was perfect for side-scrolling games like Super Mario Bros, and while the game never changed its vertical axis, this helped manage rendering all the huge horizontal levels. Due to technical limitations, each tile set could only have one palette with three different colors plus black, which can also work as a transparent pixel. The NES was also limited to only 4 different palettes, so that's 12 colors plus black that you can only use on the screen at once. You can also combine multiple sprites into one sprite, and Mario was actually 4 different sprites grouped together. You can also do the same thing with the background tile sets, turning 4 into 1 meta tile, which saves some space in storage. The NES would allow 256 different 8x8 sprites, and 64 sprites were allowed to be on the screen at once. However, the NES could only load 8 sprites into the same horizontal axis, and it would stop drawing sprites after that. And some of the sprites were manually programmed to do a little flickering effect if the amount of sprites were past the 8 sprite limit. Mario uses 91 8x8 sprites total. They all face right, and in order for the sprite to look to the left, the sprites were programmed to be flipped horizontally. Some of the other characters, such as the red and green Koopa Troopas, are the exact same sprites, but they use different color palettes. 
For the programming side, the NES games ran and was coded with the 6502 assembly CPU, which was also used for other systems such as the Apple II and the Commodore 64. And here's what the programming language looks like. Don't worry, I don't understand any of this either. And compare that to the other languages such as C Sharp, which is commonly used in game engines such as Unity. You still may not understand it either, but it looks much easier to figure it out compared to assembly. What was different about the assembly programming language was a symbolic representation of machine code. So it wouldn't just be a single language, but rather a group of languages, and it was used to control your program closely down to the byte and bit level. For those who are experienced in programming, do you know all the sweet variables and functions that make your life easier? You know those debuggers to know exactly what programming problems you had and you can solve them easily? Yeah, well good luck with that, because the assembly language doesn't have any of that. Or not as much. Like I've said before, the programming ROM had 32 kilobytes of data, but it split up into four slots with eight kilobytes of storage each, and the problem was that no matter what your ROM size was, you could only access the code eight kilobytes at a time by swapping bits and pieces in and out of these slots. And since the memory barely had any data, it would often run out of memory and you would have to move one bank to another and then back all of it, and it would also slow things down. Aside from the coding limitations, what you programmed and how you programmed the games can also change the game's performance. I'm sorry to bring this up, Alex, but do you know all the messy code Yandere's simulator had with its game? You may not know how to code, but you could take one look at the code and go, yeah, that's a mess. So how do you code a game and make it not eat up so much data and performance? Well, it depends. From coding experiences, it's not always about the amount of lines of code you use for your game. Sometimes changing one line of code can make a big difference in the game's performance, and sometimes it can depend on the programming language you use. Finally, let's take a look at the sounds played in the NES. The NES had five different voices. The first and second voice could only play square waves. The third voice could only play triangle waves. The fourth voice could only play noise waves, and the fifth voice was used as PCM sample sounds such as the drums you hear in Super Mario Bros. 3. The music would be created using some music tracker software in order to run on the fly on the NES. You may notice in Super Mario Bros. that if you're getting a power up, jumping on some Goombas, or hitting that hammer to defeat Bowser, some of the background music seems to drop some instruments. That's because if the game wanted to play some sound effects, it would need to use one of the voices such as the triangle and noise channels, and it would often drop that voice of the music to play that sound effect. So what's the point of all this? Why do I need to know this when my shitty computer can run gigabytes of data just fine? I mean, it's not like I'm going to be coding any NAS games, right? Right? Well, the fact is, everyone runs into some limitations. After all, blind people have to walk down the street when they can't really see anything. And the same thing goes to game developers. Some people can't draw, some people can't code, and some people can't build anything properly. But they can and will find solutions for the things that they can't do. But I would like to take a moment to appreciate all the NES game developers back then, as they were the early pioneers of game development and they used their limitations to give us some amazing games like Super Mario Bros. Even some people in the modern era have built their own NES games from what they learned with the NES and using their own limitations. Speaking of which, I would like to thank Morphcat Games, the creator of Myco Mages, and VBlank Entertainment, the creator of Retro City Rampage. Both of them did an awesome explanation on how they created their own games for the NES, which taught me a lot more about how the NES works. And also, I will link in the description their videos because they explain this stuff better than I did. Uh, anyways, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.